So we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, the first question we ask everyone is, is uh, how did you discern a call into pastoral ministry? Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit of that story about how you discern the call. I grew up in church. Oops, and that... You're on. I think you're on. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in a free church, a little rural country church out in South Dakota. And when I came to Trinity here to go to college, I got to sing in a gospel team, a group of seven, where I met my wife, and we traveled all over the country singing in churches. So I had that was a great experience. And I just decided, you know, I like churches. I'm okay, and I know what to do here. I can get up in front. And so I came straight to seminary, and uh, after a year, after my first year, I took a... Uh, uh, an early internship, a summer internship. In the course of reading for the internship, I came across the counsel of, if you can do anything other than be a pastor, you should. It's a different way of speaking of a call. And I don't know if that's the best advice for everybody, but I took it pretty seriously, and I realized, oh, I could easily do other things. I don't, I don't have any great sense that I have to do this. It just seems like sort of the obvious thing. Well, when I came back from that summer, I was offered a job working here, and I ended up working full-time for Trinity for several years and in public relations, that kind of thing. And then I worked in another organization in fundraising. And um, one day, after my first year, my uh, boss, who was a wonderful Christian man, we had a job review. And I had to fill out a bunch of stuff. And when I walked into his office, the first thing he said to me that Monday was... uh, With your interests, why aren't you in the ministry? And uh, I didn't really have much of an answer for him. And then uh, the next day, one of my best friends happened to come to visit me at work. He was a pastor up in Wisconsin. What he was doing in Carroll Stream, I don't know. But we went out and talked, and I told him how I really didn't feel like I was very qualified for the work I was doing, that I didn't have the chutzpah to go and ask people for money much longer. And he said, well, Lee, I always thought you ought to be a pastor. So I went home and told my wife this. Uh, Susan, who was here with us this morning, uh, she slipped out. Um, Susan never wanted to be married to a farmer or a pastor, she said. And I told her what my friend had said, and she says, yeah, he's right. That's what you ought to be doing. And about two days later, out of the blue, a church I had sung in probably five years before in Colorado called and said, we have a position open for a youth pastor, and you, you came to our minds. So in one week, I had four unexpected uh, encounters with the idea of the ministry, and I decided that was a call. I didn't eventually take that church, but I just I decided that was my call to the ministry. And uh, lo and behold, uh, that was in the fall. By December, the church I attended here, North Suburban, offered me a position and offered to pay my way to school while I went to work full-time. So that's how I came to this, and I have uh, always since then been confident of this call that God gave me. Hmm. That's a great story. What uh, One of the things that I know that our students wonder about a lot is, uh, you know, around here we hear about uh, emerging trends, um, things that we see happening in the culture at large that, that are impacting the way people do pastoral ministry. And um, as someone who is in the trenches, so to speak, are there, and I know that you are very, uh, you make it a point to be very involved in the lives of, of unbelievers. Um, I, I hear stories from people that go to your church about, about how you hang out at Einstein Brothers and, uh, and just, you know, try to really make sure that you, you're having lots of weekly contact with unbelievers. Um, can you tell us about trends that you're seeing in the culture at large that are impacting how you're doing ministry? Um, or if there, if there are things like that, perhaps perhaps there aren't. I just figured out my mic was not on. Now you can hear me. I won't wear out my voice anymore. I don't think I'm a... You know, some of you are so astute in observing culture. But just from hanging out at Einstein's, my other office, and uh, the, the the reading I do... I think one of the challenges to the church is that people are pretty seriously inoculated against Jesus' talk. I mean, I think it's striking that you will see in the newspaper the expression that so-and-so had a come-to-Jesus talk in, in their office. 
This is, this is common speech today in the business world. We had a come to Jesus meeting. It meant uh, we, we, we were called on the carpet. You know, it's time for uh, walk, the, walk the aisle. And my sense is, at least where I go, is that I have to be pretty patient in talking about Christ in the Bible because they think they know what they're going to hear. Uh, I'm not very astute about postmodernism and modernism and all that kind of thing. I don't really think about it much. I just hang out with people and try to be a, a friend. And I often feel like I should have been much more outspoken. I should have, you know, driven a little more intently to somebody's heart than I do. But I just sense that we have to be very patient and they have to see something different in us. I love a poem that I read years ago, and a part of it says, uh, For me, it was not the truth you taught to you so clear, to me so dim. But when you came, you brought a sense of him. And so that's uh, kind of my personal angle in dealing with people, is to try to bring a sense of Christ. And just be asked the question is a good reminder that I need to be more conscious of that. Uh, when I have opportunities to hang out with uh, with unbelievers. Yeah. I don't know. I find in a lot of my interactions with unbelievers, too, that I, I get the sense sometimes that they think in some ways that they have rejected the gospel. But they really haven't rejected the gospel because I don't think they've known it. But inside, sometimes they think that, that they have. You know, right. I remember it. hearing Jay Kessler say once uh, about somebody who said, they didn't believe in God. And he says, well, tell me about the God you don't believe in. I maybe don't believe in him either. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that is. I also find that simply hanging out, even watching, let alone speaking, to unbelievers, tenderizes me to the world they live in. Mm. It's just a really significant thing to listen to people talk at Einstein's. And their worries about their kids and their, you know, the job politics and, and just the stuff that people are living with uh, day in and day out. And. You know, when old Jerry kind of comes tottering in and he tells me that there's really bad news from the doctor and the cancer has spread, you know, he's, he's this old Jewish guy. He doesn't get the gospel. I don't even know how to begin to talk to him, but at least my heart goes out to him. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's a great thing for us. We can get so uh, hidden away in dealing with the things of the mind that our hearts aren't very sensitive. Mm. That's good. Well, speaking about uh, that sort of a thing, um, I wonder, I'm wondering if you have any examples of people that, that you've patterned your, your sort of style of ministry after. Uh, I guess I'm asking specifically, like, do you have any heroes in pastoral ministry? Hmm. Like people that you, growing up, that you watched or people that you say that, that person really gets it in this area? It's so funny you ask that because I just read a le- an article in Leadership Journal on the plane about the importance of heroes and what they tell about us. And I was sitting there thinking, golly, do I have any... I have any heroes? Uh, I do. I, they've been heroes at different stages. When I was a student here, the president was Harry Evans. He was a model to me of a man who lived authentically, and I really loved that. I had never really f- understood authentic, honest Christianity growing up in a kind of a wooden uh, country church. Uh, my preaching hero is uh, Alexander McLaren. McLaren lived at the same time as Spurgeon in uh, Birmingham, England. He was quite different than uh, Spurgeon. He was not particularly colorful. He was very single-minded. When he'd go to study, go into a study every morning, he'd put on work boots. It's my favorite thing about him. Because <laughs> he thought that he wanted to remember he was like all the guys going to the mills in Birmingham. What I love about him was, one, he was an expositor, and two, he was a master of the English language. He, he spoke beautifully. And I love things put beautifully. I have more of an artist's heart by far than a scholar or a businessman's heart. And uh, so I, I gravitate to that. I was telling the guys in my class this morning, I just was reading poetry uh, on vacation, among other things, and some novels and things, because that stirs me. So... The, the Christian thinkers who are in the arts are meaningful to me. And I don't know if there's one that particularly stands out, but when I run into them, I, I think they're really interesting. Um, that's enough. There are others, but that's enough. 
How does that, how do you see, um, this is not on the five questions, so we're off the track. Sorry. Um, we're, we're about to go off the rails. How do you see your artist's heart, um, sort of this, this artistic view of the world, how do you see that impacting your preaching? And do you have any advice for students, perhaps, who feel that way, that, that, that they're artists too, and they maybe see the world, they feel like they maybe see the world a bit differently, and they're wondering about how to, how to make, and how that squares with their preaching gifts? Yeah, first of all, you have to remember that you are the servant of the text. It, there's no merit in getting wonderfully creative if you didn't serve the text. Uh, you don't get that choice of being, you know, doing really cool imaginative things if the text didn't get to have its say. Um, but that said, I think something that's missed in the idea of exegesis is that most passages have emotional exegesis as well as uh, language. There are high points and there are low points. There are places where the, the writer, I believe, you know, heaved a sigh of sadness or his pulse quickened. And I think part of preaching is to find ways through the rhetorical skills, the, the, the rhetorician's art, to duplicate the emotional punch of a passage of scripture. Often that is at the main points, but it isn't always. Sometimes what I call the wow factor isn't maybe the main thing in a text, but it needs to be there. And so this is where the art, the artist's heart finds a place. Because what artists do is think in terms of emotional impact and um, imagery. And so uh, when I sit down to write a sermon, I, I manuscript sermons. Uh, it, Thomas Paine said, writing makes the exact man. And it makes me, if you thought I was long, you should have heard it if I hadn't written it. Because I really can't contain myself. Uh, but in writing, I find, I love the, uh, even though it's really hard work, I love the, uh, the challenge of finding a way to move people or to say something in a non-cliched way. Mm-hmm. My, favorite, my favorite line in the sermon this morning, which was not the most important by any means, but it was my favorite because I just thought of it, was on the Holy Spirit's first day of work. Mm-hmm. He helped with this sermon. I love that. I never thought of that before. And I love the, the imagination of it. And just, it was fun to me to come up with it. And uh, I think that reading poetry or novels uh, or anything, looking for the well-turned phrase, there's this false idea, if I may respectfully say so, in academia that the best way to say things is as plainly as possible. That is not true all the time. Uh, Sometimes the best way to tell a most important thing is to tell a story like the prodigal son. Or to use an imagery, uh, an image, uh, a metaphor that makes people sit back and it kind of goes off like a time bomb later. Uh, that's what good poetry does. That's what uh, stories do. Great authors. I just read uh, East of Eden by John Steinbeck, and it's, it's, a, it's a Bible story. It's a resetting of the story of Cain and Abel. And this, this book keeps going off in my head, little bombs. I mm-hmm. think, oh, oh, that was, that was the mm-hmm. So I think preaching should have some of that sometimes, and uh, that's what I love about it. I love being involved in the worship Part the music and those things because I like them to all hook together, and I love when they all dovetail and everything falls into place. Thanks. I'm wondering, as you think back over your years in pastoral ministry, if you could share with us, um, is there a high point? I mean, is there a point when you look back and you say, "That is really when the church was doing what she should be doing," or? This is when I feel like uh, everything kind of came together. Um, And then also, uh, if you'd share with us what you're comfortable sharing, maybe 
what was the, what has been the lowest point uh, that you're comfortable sharing with us um, in your pastoral ministry? Well, the lowest points have been where I felt the church had no faith. I remember just with great pain a night when we had an opportunity in a previous church I served to hire a young woman. We had the money, and she was a master at prayer. And I thought, what a cool thing. Let's hire Shelly part-time to teach us about prayer. And I screwed up because I hurried this through the process too quickly, and there wasn't enough buy-in. So that was my mistake. But that night, I remember that congregational meeting, one of my former chairmen standing to say, if we need to have somebody on our staff to teach us about prayer, what's that say about us? I thought, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> exactly. I agree with that. <laughs> uh, and when, we, when they went to vote, we missed it by about two votes. I was standing in the back, the meeting had gone long, and I was supposed to go meet with a new members class right across the hall. They're sitting there waiting. And I was so discouraged with that church. Um, there are other things, too. Uh, some of the low points for me probably have been where I screwed up really badly and where I had to say I was sorry in a public meeting for being harsh or insensitive and, you know, sometimes when you say those things, you're not sure how much you mean them. You know, you kind of want them to go, yeah, and we haven't been so great either. But <laughs> they didn't say that. Um, <laughs> I think of some fights I've had. I had an associate. My first, my first associate came to a free church and decided to kind of pick a fight with uh, us about infant baptism. And I handled it terribly. I, I really got militant. I, I'm not, I don't hold in from baptism, but you know what? That was a stupid thing to fight about. It could have been handled in such, with such grace. And he, he can take care of himself and whatever his needs are, but I'm embarrassed at the way I fought about that. There are more than I want to tell you, but uh, a high point for me was actually not in a time when the church achieved something, because churches plod. You know, there's, there's not many times, I mean, you move into a new building or something, <clears throat> that's kind of a big deal, but you don't really get a, a day very often where you go, wow, look at this. This is so great. But I love the story of my last day in my last church, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. I'd been there almost 14 years, and it was a uh, great day. At the end of the service, an elder came up, and he said, had Susan and I come on the platform, and he said, we want to leave you with an image. And he said, uh, if you came to Christ during the years of Lee's ministry, would you stand up? And then he said, if Lee dedicated your child, would you stand up? And if marriage, or, you know, and he went through all kinds of these things. And people are not only standing, but now they're raising their hands. And I thought, there are not many jobs where you get to see what you've done. I remember those days going to a restaurant one night to have coffee or supper with somebody, and there was a retirement party in a side room, about 12 people. And I suppose they gave them a gold watch or something. I thought, what a job I've had. I thought about all the colleagues, the pastors who've never gotten anything like that, missionaries and other servants who've never had that happen. And that day just was incredibly precious to me. And then I told them, I said, you can plan anything in that service you want, but I get to give the benediction. And so I gave the ironic benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. And when I finished, unbeknownst to me, they had a choir in the back prepared to sing it, the same words, with the amens. So I got to just stand there and look up and down the aisles at every face while they sang. And that was my last service in that church. I thought that day you would kill for my job. <laughs> this is a great job. Thanks. Well, you've got a, a bunch of young ministers, counselors, future uh, academics uh, sitting before you. Um, 
What do you want to say to them? Um, for the for our pastors in training in particular, what 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 do you want to say? What what do they need to hear? What's what's really important? I want you to know that being a pastor is the greatest job in the world. I I don't know if this is true. I heard once that Spurgeon said, "If God has called you to preach, don't settle for being a king." You will hear a lot of scary stories about the ministry because it's a brutal business sometimes, and people really get hurt badly. But I'm telling you, in my experience, this is a job worth having. It is cutting edge. Who else? Name a lawyer or a judge or a doctor or, or anyone else. You have a teacher, anything else that gets to do what we get to do. It gets to handle the word of God. It gets to be there when babies are born and people die, when they come and tell you their hardest things, when they say, I've never told anybody to this, uh, this before in my life. When they come up and say the significance of something you've done, thank you for being their pastor. I love this job, and I believe God called me here. I left a church that was several times larger to come to this church, and I confess I thought this church would be as big as that one in no time because I thought, you know, I'm so gifted. (laughs) And that was a good awakening, too. But I felt called to be near a church, or near a seminary, because I heard Dr. Carson say, what denominations ought to do is put their best preachers in the churches around their seminaries. And I remember that night thinking, Lord, if you'd let me be worthy of that, I would go to a small church so I could do that. I want you to know, I love talking to students about being a pastor and the related ministry jobs, because this is the greatest job that you can find. It's not easy. It's not fun all the time. But talk about an adventure if God should call you. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite Owen to come, and uh, he's going to lead us in a time of uh, questions from you guys. All right. Any questions for uh, Pastor Lee? from his talk or just on your heart, on your mind. And if you could wait for the microphone, it will come. Hi. Hi, Emily. Pastor Lee, I was wondering, I I heard that you were going to share your testimony. Could you tell us how you came to know the Lord? Yes. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, And I remember asking Christ into my heart before I was uh, in school. Interestingly, my mother has no recollection of that. She she helped me. I can remember the scene. (laughs) An evangelist, I guess she's not. I don't know. Her name is Grace. She ought to be good at it. Um, (laughs) But then in high school, I went through a time, I wouldn't say rebellion, but of considerable doubt. Not doubt about the faith. I never doubted that. I had doubt that I could be saved. And the reason was I grew up in an environment where there were lots of invitations. And to tell you the truth, I hate going forward. I hate doing what the mass does. I just hate doing it. I was the only kid in my high school class. I wore a tie to school because I didn't like being like everybody else. (laughs) So the idea of having to go up with everybody just was a turnoff. Well, what settled in me was I didn't do that because I, didn't, I wasn't serious about God. And then my sense was I had resisted the Lord, and now he had left me, and I was adrift. So I doubted my saveability. And it was just before, uh, days before my high school graduation that an older uh, friend uh, who was involved in a campus Christian group, I was talking to him, and I finally divulged this. I'd never told anyone. I'm from a little town. You've got to be careful what you say. Little church. And he's, he just talked to me about faith, that you ask God and don't keep asking and believe God's promises. And that was a turning point for me. And I remember I would sing quite often in my little home church. They weren't picky, you know, when you're in a little church. And uh, I had decided that I was a hypocrite every time I sang. But there was a song I really loved, and I decided I'll never sing this unless it's true. And it was the old Ethel Waters song, uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And the verse is, I sing, or the chorus, I sing because I am happy, I sing sing because I'm free. And I remember in June getting up to sing that. 
This last summer, I went home for my, my church's 100th anniversary. They let me preach. And one of the guys, who's now a man, said, I remember that day. I remember when you said that. And it made an impact on me. I'll let you point. Yeah, let's go here. You had mentioned that you make it an intentional effort to figure out ways to still being involved in evangelism and getting involved. Just what are some of the tangible things? Uh, is it just sitting at Einstein's or is there other things that you do or would recommend for pastors to do to make sure that they're still keeping that fresh and active there? You know, I am not good at evangelism. And I, I was really offended in my previous church when a guy told me that he was going to start praying for me to have a burden for evangelism. It just ticked me off. I thought, go pray for yourself. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I got my hands full. I got a whole church to take care of. But he was right. And his prayers availed much. And uh, I, I like people. I mean, it's easy for me to talk to people. I, I did that before we started. I just like walking around talking to people. So hanging out at Einstein's is perfect for me because it's kind of an open thing. And you can talk to the lady at the next table about the weather and who knows what. And pretty soon you talk about interesting things, important things. Sometimes never. There's guys in there I see and I say hello and we never talk. i got my eye on one guy right now who's a, a Jewish fellow that I'd love to give a New Testament to. And I think I should. I've just been trying to find a way. Um, we have neighbors who, uh, we have some new neighbors who just moved in. They're he's a PhD. They're from India. We've really enjoyed them. They went with us to Ravinia, and uh, we're going to try to do more of that. It's hard as a pastor because, one, you don't have much time, and two, I get peopled out. I don't need more people in my life. You know, I don't really need any friendships anymore. I mean, I got boatloads of them. So, it's an effort to go engage with anyone, in church or unbelievers. And unbelievers are less interesting to me, typically, than a thoughtful believer. So it's hard work, but that's what I try to do. Uh, my question is, uh, has there ever been a period of time where you've doubted your call? And if so, what, what was it that made you uh, stand firm and uh, continue? You know, I haven't doubted the call. It was so strong to me. And it's so set in my head that this, you know, he led captives in his train and he gave some to be apostles and prophets and pastors. I think I am a captive. I don't have a choice about this. It doesn't matter what, whether I like it or I don't like it. I'm, this is the way it is. I have doubted my effectiveness. Uh, I tell you, you know, I serve a wonderful church here. Just a terrific church. And I love it uh, tremendously. But I feel personally responsible that it hasn't really grown very much. Now, that may not even be fair. It may not be me at all. I, on my good days, I think, I think this is the way God wants it. We grow 20% a year. We just lose 20% a year. So it's hard to keep up. But I do get fits where I think, oh, they need a, they need a guy who, you know, more visionary and something. And that's hard, and I have to find people to kick me in the pants and talk to me. My elders have been good about that. My wife is good about that. Uh, you said that you wanted to uh, pass a church that's close to a seminary. And uh, uh, can you, uh, now you have been, you know, uh, Pastor for uh, many years, uh, yes. close to uh, Trinity, right? Can you uh, mention something like the uh, positive impacts uh, that the seminary has on your church, or is there any negative impacts? I'd say the only negative impact is the the turnover. It's just it's painful in a church like ours to fall in love with so many people, some of whom are in this room, and know that I have to say goodbye over and over and over. But I love that, if you pardon the condescension, that my boys are all over the world. That is just, that's a, a trip to think about that. The benefit to our church is immense, uh, especially seminary students, more so than typically college students. You are folks who want to be involved in a church. 
you are thoughtful about church, you take the Lord's work seriously, you, you, I love having students in the church. And a special bonus is all the places that the students come from. Not only faraway countries, which is extraordinary, but just all over the United States. And to have that cross-pollination in a church all the time, it is to the great credit of this congregation that they are great about this. And I work at making that true. We are proud to be a Trinity Church. We, we love it, and we, are, we believe it's one of our most um, essential uh, values, core values, is to invest in students as God gives us the ability. And you just kind of pray that he keeps the balance so we don't get overwhelmed, because uh, we're not huge. And I'm quite convinced that one reason our church is not too large is that if, my, if, the, if this congregation, if I was senior pastor of a church of hundreds, I, I've been that. There's no time to sit and talk to people. You can't sit and, and chat about preaching and counseling and just do that. You just, you've got to be moving all the time. The strategic dem- demands of pastoring a large church are counterproductive to any broad mentoring and uh, relationship building. So all in all, I like, I like this. Could you, uh, <clears throat> I'll throw in a question. Could you talk to us about uh, the current state of mentoring among the pastorate, broadly speaking? Are you seeing other pastors have a heart and a burden for, for mentoring mm-hmm. younger guys? And, and then could you talk about what you do specifically to identify students to mentor and, and uh, how you carry that out? I'm in a pastor's prayer group every, uh, every other Wednesday morning with about, uh, how many are we now, nine or ten? From churches to the north of here in, in different places, several different denominations. <coughs> I think several of these, go- some are already doing quite a lot with students. I think several would like to and nobody's asking. Um, so I think pastors would enjoy, you know, it's really cool to sit and talk to somebody about what you do. i, I got to confess, I never really enjoyed um, discipling believers, you know, going through the same stuff over and over. Premarital counseling is like that. I mean, I've done scores of couples, and I love the couples, but I get really bored doing the same stuff. But I never get tired of talking about preaching or hospital calls or any, any any of the pastoral things. And I think some of my colleagues are like that. Some are too busy, and some don't resonate with that particular ministry. But uh, what I actually find is a harder problem is teachable students. It isn't that students are too proud to learn. It's that you're often too busy to learn. And the things I teach, you can't learn in sitting down for an hour in a lecture hall you got to hang out with me. And I don't know any other way to do it. I do meet with the students from our church every week uh, for an hour here on campus, and I bring in something that's on my docket. You know, the elders were talking about this, or I had, what would you do if you had this kind of counseling situation, or I was trying to plan a sermon series, and this is what I was thinking, or anything I can think of. And I hope that's useful. I offer to the students in church that I'd like to I'll meet with them just about any time I can. When I love, I hate the, fall, or the spring when students are leaving. I hate that feeling, saying goodbye, seeing our numbers go down, losing all these wonderful people. I love August, September, October when the new folks start coming and checking out our church, and I meet somebody and I think, I wonder if this student I will know for the rest of his life. I think that all the time. Because some come and some leave and all that. Hmm. And I try with students as much as I can to say, to tell them what we do in our church, how we could help them, to make myself available. Uh, to just chat, and I just feel like that's what the Lord has given me the time to do, so that's what I try to do. Hmm. Okay. I have a question. Um, this is kind of a, just a real practical thing, but I know in, in my experience just um, hospital visits have been sometimes... You know, awkward or not sure what to do, and I'm I'm guessing a lot of other guys and, and girls in here would feel the same way at least initially. 
you have any just practical, um, just basic advice on when to do it, how to do it, anything yeah. like that? You know, when I went on my internship that first summer, and the pastor said one afternoon that we were going to go visiting the people in the church. I didn't have to do anything. And they weren't even in the hospital. We were going to their living rooms. I was terrified. I remember this day, the anxiety, and I had nothing to do. We were going to people I knew and sitting in their living rooms. I thought, thinking of it now, I go, what's your problem? Going to the hospital, usually you're visiting people you know. Um, I go without a lot of plan. I mean, you don't know what you're walking into. The biggest danger is being glib, kind of going on autopilot. Go in, read a little scripture, pray, leave, you know, and you just, you didn't, you didn't engage. It, it, the hard part for me is making time to go. I, I'm a task-oriented guy. When I'm there, I like it. I don't really have trouble when I'm there. I just have trouble thinking an hour driving over there and visiting and getting back is worth it, you know, because I've got so many other things to do. Um, when I'm there, I try to simply be kind. And if kindness dictates reading or listening and just chatting while sitting there and talking, last visit I made, I think we talked about crossword puzzles and uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. One of my favorite secrets is if somebody's really sick, I sing. Uh, <laughs> it might make them sicker, but uh, I learned this once visiting a lady here in Northbrook who had MS, and she had you know, terrible breathing problems. And I went to see her, and she was in a intensive respiratory care, intensive care unit. You know. There were four uh, beds the curtains weren't drawn, so nurses are coming and going. Jenny was, I didn't know if she was in a coma, if she could hear. I didn't know, she couldn't respond. I felt so helpless. I was quite sure to read something wouldn't register. And it was this awful feeling. And I remember the Lord kind of, I think it was the Lord kicking me going, sing. I'm going, sing? Here? Mm-hmm. Nurses come and go? I was... I was as intimidated as you would be. You know, you heard me sing this morning, and you might think, well, that's easy for you. It is not easy to sing in an intensive care unit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had somebody give me a pitch this morning, and I <coughs> practiced and all that. I did. I started to sing. And I said, Jenny, let's because I knew she loved to sing. I knew she knew the hymns, and I'd sing hymns. And if I couldn't remember the words, I stopped. I'd go, I can't remember anymore. And if I started it too low, I'd go, oh, that's the wrong key, and I'd start over. And... And I'd, I'd sing. And uh, I don't know what everybody else thought. Now I think nobody minded. I know that. I know that that was a blessing to other people. And I love the time I, I used to visit a fellow named Bob. He was hospitalized for forever in an inter- intensive care ward. And I'd sing to him sometimes. And one time when I was leaving, he said, um, I said, Bob, I'm really sorry I have to go. i got to get back to work. And he goes, that's okay. When you're not here, I can hear you singing. So I like, when I get there, when I can just get myself out the door, I like, I like people. I just think they're interesting. I think, it's, you know, I try to have a sense of humor. I mean, it isn't always appropriate to kid around, but usually in a hospital room you can kid around. People aren't, you know, desperately, they're, they're just bored, and, you know, you can have fun. Uh, but don't, don't be afraid and, and pray for them. Just pray for them. They love to have somebody pray for them. It's a, more powerful than we realize. Um, in your experience, having um, known many uh, seminary students and, and obviously having known many pastors um, and knowing yourself, what is one thing that you would suggest to us? Um, I don't know if warning is too strong a word, but... Uh, um, what is what is the one thing that you would ask us all to guard against or, or to guard our hearts with respect to? Well, it depends on your nature. There are a few of you here who will never have to worry about working too hard. <laughs> and I would put myself mostly in that camp. 
But there are a lot of folks who will work too hard, whether smart or not is another issue. Uh, but I think one of the tricks of the ministry is there are certain demands of your faith that are unique to the pastorate. It is an act of considerable faith to take your day off, especially if you happen to have it scheduled late in the week. Uh, it's just really hard to believe that it's going to get done if you don't go in and do it. Um, it's hard to believe when you get up to preach that anything's going to happen. And you can start fiddling with sermons or whatever you're doing up to the last minute. Um, I think it's really hard to be authentic. This job, you, you know, you're... You're like those priests handling holy things all the time. You can get pretty cavalier about the holy things you handle, the scriptures, prayer, the church, the people. I mean, pastors have better stories than anybody. You know, if I sat down with any of the, the brothers here and we went and had coffee and we started talking about church, we got a million of them because we <laughs> fascinating things happen in our, in our job. But you can't get jaundiced about that. You can't. And another danger for us in the ministry, especially the older we get, is anger. I, I uh, remember helping or being interviewed for an article years ago about that was eventually titled uh, something like "Why am I angrier than I used to be?" And the ministry, you know, remember the remember the men in the in the Bible who led. There's a lot of frustration. And I knew that it was time for me to leave Beaver Falls when I was mad more often than I should be. I just was ticked off. And I thought, I don't think I'm getting over this. I, I think I need to take a break and start over. Because um, it wasn't fair to them. And, you know, the next guy came, wired completely different. They've blown the doors off. They've won people to the Lord. I mean, it's a great thing. I, I, and I'm thankful that my legacy is is intact, you know, that it didn't go down, that it went up. But I think we do need uh, to hold each other, you know, not so, we always talk about accountability with sexuality and stuff, but I'm more needed to not get sour, to not get uh, casual. You know, that's, that's harder when you have to, you just get up and do the same thing. We're going to lead worship again. It's, oh, Look, oh, man, it's the pastoral prayer. What am I going to say? You know, and you rip through it, and you stand there and sing, and you do all this stuff professionally. And you can't get all emotional and jazzed about everything all the time, but you do have to take it seriously. Yes. And this will uh, this will be our last question, I think. Where does a pastor go when the pastor needs care? Well, this pastor, um, I have several things that are really significant in my life. One is my pastor's prayer group. Uh, Steve Farish, who preached for me on uh, Tuesday, is in that group. We've been together now about nine years. That, and this is my experience in Pennsylvania, that is the safest place I know. These guys aren't going to steal anybody. They're not going to get mad at me. They're not going to talk. That's a safe place. Uh, my home is a, a good place. The challenge in our home is that my wife works at church. She likes to talk about work at home, and I really don't. So that poses some challenges sometimes, because I really can leave it. I'd rather work late and not take anything home. But we do both understand and love the church. We, she loves being a pastor's wife. And um, Another really important thing is to have friends that you laugh with. I think one of the things that dawned on me when I was in Pennsylvania after many years was there's nobody here who's ever asked me, hey, would you like to go to a game? Do you want to go to a movie? I'm sure they would have. If I would have. I didn't signal probably the proper thing. But... I have two great friends around here, plus my uh, younger brother lives here. And I love getting together with Bill or Jim and yucking it up. The best therapy is to laugh. And if you're trying to help a pastor, get him to laugh. Go have fun. 
you know, you don't have to be reverent, and I mean, I don't mean that negatively, but you, you don't have to always be talking about church stuff. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. I take my days off. I take all my vacation. In fact, I took a little more than my vacation. Uh, uh, <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> so I do those things, and I encourage my brothers to do that because it's uh, it is draining. Uh, it's energizing work, but it's draining, you know. And uh, um, you know, after preaching this morning and all this stuff, I probably go take a nap because I'm I'm beat. So uh, so what? I can do that. The Lord won't be mad, and I, I may do that. Well, we hope that you will. <laughs> um, just, we're very thankful for your ministry to us and uh, thankful that you were able to come today and speak to us in chapel. We really appreciated your message, being Thank part you. of the Timothy series. And uh, let me just close in prayer uh, for Pastor Lee, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray.